Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Society of Landscape Architects, Day 2, 2012 General Session. And now, please welcome the Executive Vice President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Landscape Architects, Nancy Somerville. Good morning and welcome back to the 2012 ASLA Annual Meeting and Expo. 2012 has brought some major challenges and happily some equally major milestones. In the challenges category, the most significant have been in the public policy arena. Last year, I reported that the active transportation programs in the Surface Transportation Act were under direct attack. Last fall and through the winter, we beat back multiple attempts to zero out several of the key programs that are important, not just to landscape architects, but to the livability and economic vitality of our communities. Transportation enhancements, recreational trails, complete streets, and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. In the final surface transportation bill, signed into law in July, most of these programs survived but bike and pedestrian programs were significantly scaled back. The focus is now on the states where governors can choose to opt out of the recreational trails program. They can also transfer half of the funding that should be dedicated to bicycle and pedestrian projects to road and highway projects. Should governors exercise these options, landscape architectural projects will be significantly scaled back. These are also dangerous times for licensure. We have seen state after state offer up deregulation as a small government solution. Our chapters have fought back successfully, but there are serious threats still pending and likely more to come. While the challenges are plentiful, there are also hopeful milestones along the road. One of those is the growing recognition of the profession's role in creating green infrastructure. Two weeks ago, I attended the first ever White House Summit on Municipal Stormwater Management. It was telling that the title of the conference was Going from Gray to Green. In Congress, the Green Infrastructure for Clean Water Act and the Urban Revitalization and Livable Communities Act are two important green infrastructure bills that ASLA is working to pass. If you are not already an active participant in our advocacy network, sign up. In these tough times, it is more important than ever to speak up on behalf of the profession. Although landscape architects' numbers are small, when we all work together, your voice is heard. Along with advocacy, public awareness continues as a top priority. 2012 marks the second year in an ongoing public awareness campaign. Last year, we launched the grassroots campaign when some 1,000 volunteers took to the streets to engage their communities in discussions about the profession. And this year continued the campaign, first with national celebrations of Frederick Law Olmsted's birthday, then with Celebrate Your Public Landscapes events in September that focused on iconic parks, plazas, and trails, often with elected officials as guests. Add National Landscape Architecture Month activities, and the count is more than 600 events attracting public and media attention. These three initiatives generated more than 300 TV, print, and online stories. On the PR and communications side, much of our energy and creativity continues to be focused on web communications because of the ability of the web to reach the largest audience. Our web stats, which have always been impressive, are hitting new heights this year. With unique visitors tracking and amazing 45% ahead of the same period in 2011, almost half of whom are new visitors to the site. We are on track to top 1 million unique visitors this year. One of the special content areas on the website, Designing Our Future, Sustainable Landscapes, continues to draw praise and heavy traffic. 
the 30 case studies and nine animations show how landscape architecture is helping to solve pressing issues of public and environmental health. Brand new on our website is the Landscape Architects Guide to Washington, D.C. 20 landscape architects take the public through more than 75 sites in the nation's capital, educating, along the, educating them along the way about the profession and the work it does. And of course, we continue to use the DIRT blog to keep our voice in the mix. The blog consistently ranks among the top 10 on environmental subjects. The Landscape Architecture Magazine blog and The Field, the blog of ASLA's professional practice networks, both new this year, are adding to our communications and outreach network. On another front this past week, the public was asked to comment on the latest version of the Sites Rating System. The Sustainable Sites Initiative is a partnership of ASLA, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center at the University of Texas at Austin, and the U.S. Botanic Garden, with input and participation from a diverse group of individuals and stakeholder organizations. On September 17, Sites announced the certification of an additional eight pilot projects under the rating system, bringing the total to 11. Although the challenges will certainly continue, we should all take pride and celebrate the increasing recognition of the profession in media coverage with public policymakers and with allied professionals landscape architects are identified not just as key collaborators but as leaders consider this year for the first time a landscape architect has been awarded the urban land institute's nichols prize for visionaries in urban development Peter Walker will receive the award at their meeting later this year. Peter, please stand up and take a bow. And in a moment, you'll learn of another member named to a prestigious honor that recognizes a long-term contribution and commitment to the protection and conservation of natural resources through interdisciplinary thinking. This is who you all are, and increasingly, the world is taking notice. Through collaboration, creativity, and passion, you are making a difference. Thank you all. Before I bring on our panel, as the nominator of this year's recipient and a member of the Renewable Natural Resources Foundation Board, it is my honor to present this year's RNRF Sustained Achievement Award to our esteemed member, Frederick Steiner, FASLA, Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin, and a founding member of the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Fritz's achievements are many and wide, and his tireless work on behalf of the environment illustrates the open, inclusive vision that defines us all. Ladies and gentlemen, Fritz Steiner, this year's RNRF Sustained Achievement Award recipient. Thank you, Nancy, and thanks to ASLA for nominating me for this really uh, wonderful honor. It's a pleasure to accept it. Uh, having spent my career on the ecotone between two professions, um, and those of us who have studied ecology know that ecotones are especially rich and productive uh, habitats, and so the rec for the recognition of that, uh, I'm very humbled and very much uh, thank ASLA and Nancy for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Landscape Architecture Magazine, the magazine of ASLA, is proud to have Brad McKee as its editor. 
He has boldly led the magazine into new, vibrant, and unflinching territory that has raised the magazine to new heights. Need proof? The magazine has been named as a finalist in five, yes, five, different categories for the prestigious awards presented by Folio Magazine, the arbiter of excellence in magazine publishment. This morning, we are happy to have a panel of renowned design critics moderated by Brad McKee. Please help me welcome them now. All right, thank you, Nancy. Good morning, everybody. It's early, but we've got a great program for you. This morning, we're going to hear from these five folks, architecture critics at major daily newspapers around the country. They're going to tell us what they think of landscape architecture on their beats. Um, before I make introductions, though, I want to say one thing, which is newspapers are not what they used to be. Um, I started working in newspapers back when they were you know, the dominant voice in a city's civic life. But over the past decade or more, they've lost a lot of their heft and a lot of their staff. One of the first things to go has been culture coverage. It's kind of like school, where they cut gym class and art class first. But um, some papers, though, they've tried to hold fast. And I would say that the fact that we have five people who are working in newspapers who have kept salaried architecture critics around is really remarkable. And I just want to observe that fact. So let me introduce them. Starting on my far right is Inga Saffron. She is the architecture critic of the Philadelphia Inquirer. John King is the urban design critic of the San Francisco Chronicle. Stephen Litt is the art and architecture critic of the Plain Dealer in Cleveland. Christopher Hume has come to us from Canada. He is the urban affairs columnist and architecture critic at the Toronto Star. And finally, Christopher Hawthorne here on my near right is the architecture critic of the Los Angeles Times. Welcome. And now we're, we're gonna get right to business. We don't have a lot of time. We're gonna try to freewheel it. So I wanna kind of set things up generally by asking each of you in order, what is the story right now for landscape architects in your cities? Inga, you want to start us off? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. <laughs> what, is, what is the story right now for landscape architects in your city? What is the story? Yeah, what's going on? What's, bi what's a big deal? So the big story in Philadelphia um, is, uh, has to do with stormwater management. Um, Philadelphia, like so many big older cities, uh, is, is not complying with the Clean Water Act and um, uh, is trying to rectify that. Um, and instead of building really huge pipes that cost billions of dollars, um, it's trying to deal with the, the water uh, through, through parks. In fact, the slogan might be, parks, not pipes. Um, the, the plan is to add 500 acres of, of green parks that can absorb the rainwater and, and uh, it's believed if they can do this, uh, and they are on track to do it, that they can avoid bu building some really big water mains. And um, many of you probably know that um, the cost of building these pipes is becoming extremely expensive and burdensome on a lot of cities. And so this is one way for, for the city to keep those costs down and also to create really nice green spaces that people can use and um, it's been, the policy has been twinned with an effort to, to fight obesity and, and, and other health, health problems. So that, that, that's, that's the big story right now. John? San Francisco is like a lot of cities in terms of just the tension between large and small, that they're the big landscape projects like Peter Walker's firm has a five acre rooftop park that will get built in the next few years. But, Things move so slowly, and there are so many different political constraints and kind of the back and forth, especially in a city like San Francisco, that you've seen the very small-scale interventions the last few years. 
I know there was a good panel yesterday. And so there's a, just kind of a tension of people wanting to reshape the landscape in big way, make big moves, but then the financial and political and cultural reality is it's more you can tackle a little bit of an alley or a few parking spaces. And then the only other thing that I think might be unique to San Francisco is the whole issue of sea level rise. And you've got uh, San Francisco's Embarcadero waterfront is more and more kind of the symbolic showcase of the city. It's also a place where parks are having to be redesigned to slope up, not instead of down, because in the last five years, all the studies done suggest the sea is going to be that much higher. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting moment right now. Steve? So the story in, in Cleveland is typical of many uh, Midwest industrial cities that are uh, losing population but are, are seeing a resurgence in, in their downtowns and uh, a return of the, uh, the middle classes that, that fled uh, in the 1960s and 70s during the, the age of uh, blockbusting and interstate highways and all that heavy engineering. Um, so it's, it's kind of an exciting time, and it's, it's strange because you, you see the shrinkage on the one hand, but on the other hand, a lot of energy is being refocused in the center. The thing that I find most frustrating uh, about the position of landscape architecture within this story is uh, that it's not often that a landscape firm can capture a large project that has the potential to make a city more sustainable on, on an urban scale. But there's one example that I want to talk about, uh, which is the uh, Euclid Avenue bus rapid transit line that was just finished in 2008, a $200 million, did I hear some clapping out there for that? Uh, <laughs> yes, so, uh, and Sasaki Associates uh, provided the, the uh, planning, the initial planning, and then landscape services working with uh, Wilbur Smith uh, an engineering firm. And the, the finished project has been so successful, we've seen a 50% increase in ridership on that line. For a $200 million investment, uh, $6 billion of development has been supported on this four-mile line in, in, within the city of Cleveland. It's a phenomenal return on investment, and it's beautified the city. So uh, hooray for that project. Absolutely. Chris. Well, um, I'm from Canada, so you probably are not terribly aware of Toronto, but if, if I were a landscape architect, I'd be very excited. I'm not a landscape architect, I'm still excited. Um, basically, it's not about beautification, the, the big projects in, in, in Toronto right now. It's about the waterfront, and the waterfront is 2,000 acres of, of uh, what was uh, an industrial wasteland, a kind of uh, area that people avoided like the plague. And, and what's happened that's interesting is that the revitalization of the waterfront has been started, uh, kick-started by landscape architects. And, and basically what's happened is that the, the Waterfront Corporation has, has chosen uh, various people, Michael Van Valkenburg, Claude Cormier, I think who's won an award here today, the Montreal a landscape architect, uh, a bunch of other people. And what they've done is they've created a series of small projects on the waterfront that have actually allowed people to see this part of the city with new eyes. Uh, in fact, people go down there now and can understand that this would be a great place to live. And uh, as a result of these strategic projects, uh, maybe there are five or six of them, huge amounts of development have happened. And I think that what's interesting and I think what's important for landscape architects, that it's not about the prettification of a city. It's about creating value and it's about creating urbanization and it's about expanding the city into a part uh, that was, as I say, abandoned for a long, long time. So I think that the message for landscape architects is that, it, as I say, it's not just about making things that we would like to see, but about uh, changing the way people perceive the city in which they live. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, too. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, in terms of what's happening in Los Angeles, I'll answer the question in a couple of ways. One is to mention some significant projects that I've been following that are either recently completed or soon to be completed. And then, in a larger sense, talk about a kind of civic transformation that's happening in Los Angeles that I think um, holds some really exciting opportunities for landscape 
architects um, and for the city's image of itself in many ways. In terms of projects, the, uh, there is a new uh, uh, Grand Park, it's called, in the middle of Los Angeles, uh, 12 acres designed by Rios Clemente Hale uh, Studios, which is really an attempt for the first time to have a park right in the heart in the civic center of the city. Um, two of three phases of that park have opened, and the next phase will open next month. Um, so that project has been getting a lot of attention, both for its landscape elements and for its attempt to really make downtown feel a bit more central. Those of you who know LA know that uh, we have a kind of polycentric urban model, and therefore downtown has been kind of a paradox, the Oops. center of the centralist region. And so this park has been a fascinating attempt to kind of um, uh, adjust or recalibrate that that idea of what downtown can be. There's a very uh, uh, compelling design in Santa Monica for a park um, close to the waterfront, close to the beach um, by uh, James Corner Field Operations, uh, which is six or seven acres and is under construction, uh, the product of a design competition run by the city, funded mostly with redevelopment money. Uh, and then down in Orange County, of course, there's the massive Orange County Great Park, which has been a very complicated project, both in terms of design and politically its funding um, has, uh, has dried up to a certain extent and it is sort of moving along but at a more modest scale than it had originally. Uh, and then there are a number of projects around the Los Angeles River that represent a, an attempt um, really to re-engage with that landscape. There's a design competition now underway to replace one of the uh, Grand Art Deco bridges that crossed the river from the 1920s. Um, run by the Department of Transportation, the Bureau of Engineering, really a new kind of effort by bureaucracies that had been standing in the way of kind of new ways of thinking about landscape in this city, really trying to change the way we think about the river. And then in a broader sense, I think Los Angeles is in the midst of re-engaging with its public sphere in many ways. That's really become the focus of my work um, to a large extent over the last two or three years. After being such a private city, such a privatized city, a city organized around the car and the single family house for so much of the 20th century, um, Los Angeles is really kind of rediscovering its public side and it's building a comprehensive mass transit system for the first time or at least for the first time since about a century ago when we had this great streetcar network. Um, we are thinking again about the river, we're thinking about uh, there's a real flowering of bike culture, thinking about pedestrian amenities and so forth. And so. It's a really profound change in the way that Los Angeles sees itself and sort of projects its image to the world. And I think landscape architects can or, or should be at the center of that, uh, of that shift. I want to pick up on the public aspect of that because so many of the projects we talk about and worry over are driven by public agencies. So I want to ask you guys, how wise are the public agencies where you work at producing decent landscapes, at producing excellent landscapes? And how good are the landscape architects at delivering it? Well, the, the, the public agencies in Toronto, I think, have done a pretty um, poor job so far. But I, we created a, 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 a new organization called Waterfront Toronto, which has kind of an arm's length relationship with its funders, the federal, provincial, and city governments. And it's what's made the difference. But I do think that. The landscape architects have been given wonderful opportunities by this return to the city that's happening everywhere it seems except Phoenix. Um, but, <laughs> but maybe that'll happen even here, who knows? Um, but the same kind of thing is, is happening in Toronto that, that, that uh, Chris here was talking about in LA. People are suddenly discovering the city itself. And I think that the landscape architects um, have been uh, reluctant or somewhat timid to understand this, this opportunity. Um, I, I think they, they see themselves more as gardeners and, and you know, all, all of which is very civilized and civilizing, but there's a much, much larger issue and phenomenon being played out right now. And this is the great opportunity, I think, that for, for this profession. Uh, you know, and, and the wonderful thing about the waterfront is that it reversed the usual process where there's a building, 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 and then the landscape architect comes in and fills the space between them. Now what we're doing is we're filling in the spaces and then saying to the architect, okay, here's your block, here's what you can do. And I think that's a much better way to do it because in this way we can, we can design cities for people and design cities that have an actual public realm, which more than ever or more than, you know, for the first time in a long time, which is what people are looking for and what people want. On what people are seeking out. That's a switch, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs>
Fred, I, th I think the question is who's got the money? You know, which public agencies have the money? Uh, mm -hmm. in, in Cleveland, the Regional Transit Authority is a pretty progressive bunch of people. And uh, they've been working with uh, our local foundations on, on projects where uh, the foundations come in with some early money and uh, they might uh, you know, bump up the, uh, the ambition of a project and they have a better selection process and they work with the agency on getting through the, you know, the limitations of the, uh, uh, the selection process for, for designers. The Ohio Department of Transportation, which is the 900 pound gorilla, you know, all the state transportation agencies are uh, incredibly powerful and they're run by engineers. And mm, yeah. I, I find that's, that's a huge problem in the United States. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I know I can say that very popular thing to say in front of landscape architects, but I, I wish you folks could uh, work at the state level. You know, we just heard about uh, demographic changes that are favoring landscape and public space, uh, that's, that's bubbling up. But, you know, the government right now is, is, is changing and pushing uh, down uh, the, the funding for uh, all of the wonderful things that we've been talking about, bikes and trails, mm -hmm. uh, bike trails and, and things like that. So uh, you have to kind of mobilize and fight it out at the state level uh, with those transportation agencies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tough, though, because there is the back to the city movement, there is the embrace of urbanity, there is the embrace of the public realm, so on and so forth. Realistically, though, certainly in cities like San Francisco, where there are a number of different competing power interests, landscape tends to be, and landscape architects, rightly or wrongly, do not tend to be the driving forces. In San Francisco, you're going to have a whole range of different issues Everyone wants open space, everyone wants to kind of create space for people, but they also each have their own definitions of that, and there's not a lot of interest in the landscape architect coming in and showing kind of the, the way it should be done. It's more this odd thing of being more open to things, and I'm sure it's frustrating for all of you, more open to things, but also people know how they want it done. Mm -hmm. And um, just a small thing in San Francisco, you've had, uh, this is both planning and landscape architecture, a real push to try, like in the Fisherman's Wharf area, create, you know, single plane streets, like really just get more toward the European model of getting rid of sidewalks, creating things so that cars and everyone's kind of blended together, that's going to slow down car use, make a more urbane atmosphere. In San Francisco, it runs into the kind of the um, disabled access um, officials who say, no, you've got to have the queues, you've got to have the separate sidewalks. So you have this tension between a vision of the urban landscape as almost a communal place and a single interest saying, well, no, but our definition of how the space should be begins with how our interest is, deal is dealt with. And that plays out a hundred different ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to get to that, uh, back to that shift in demographics and bring up the thorny issue of gentrification because in a lot of cities you're seeing property values between cities and suburbs reverse themselves so that the land in cities is the most valuable, the most sought after, and the land in the suburbs is often underwater and in foreclosure. Um, people moving into cities tend to want amenities if they have, you know, any degree of money or political will. And I know in Washington in particular, it's been a real fight. Um, long timers in the city believe that these things are an affront, that they are a threat um, because they raise values, they raise property values, and that has the unfortunate effect of you know, taxing some people out of the city. Do you guys see that happening at all? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really big issue in, in Philadelphia, and, and this has really been a kind of golden age of park building in Philadelphia. I, I, was, I was trying to count up before I came here how many new parks there are. It's like four or five, at least, uh, real parks that have been built. Uh, and they've all been built in the kind of neighborhoods that you would expect, the downtown neighborhoods, the affluent neighborhoods, uh, the neighborhoods with 20 and 30-somethings. And, and, and they're wonderful, wonderful parks, but um, one of the good things about the city's 500-acre plan 
is that it's, it's intended to put a park within a, a 10 minute walk of every single person in the city. And so that forces the city to build parks in a lot of underserved neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, and one way they're doing it that's pretty inventive is uh, Philadelphia has a lot of old, early 20th century schools with asphalt playgrounds. And they're now tearing up these asphalt lots and um, turning them into more park-like spaces. They're p using uh, porous asphalt. Uh, that's, that's to serve the, the storm water problem, but at the same time, it's creating a lot of parks in underserved neighborhoods. And the foundations in Philadelphia, which have really been the big driver for good design, um, are now very, very focused on how, how do you bring parks to, to um, you know, the, this, these really parkless, uh, asphalt-covered neighborhoods. Well, I know, you know, even a bike lane, the, the object of bike lanes in Washington is incredibly controversial because it doesn't cost anything. You put a stripe on the street and you make some drivers mad. And, um, but people see this happening while there's still poverty in the city. And it's a matter of, you know, not trying to, you know, resist progress just because every need hasn't been taken care of. Um, do any, what, what do you see, Steve? Well, I, I think you have to draw a distinction between uh, displacement and, and yeah. gentrification. Yeah. You know, it, it, in, in Cleveland, it would be a nice thing to have the wealthy move back into the city after they fled uh, up the hill from uh, Euclid Avenue, Millionaire's Row, a century ago, and, and populated the, uh, the inner ring suburbs, which are now completely joined with the, the fate of, of Cleveland. So uh, to get some of those people to move back into the city, I think you'd see the quality of schools and public services improve, and that uh, uh, that would be a welcome thing in Cleveland. It would build the tax base back up, which is, is what the city needs so, so desperately. I, I think the interesting thing in Toronto, um, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, is, is not the, what I'm trying to say, we don't have to worry so much about the city. If Toronto is any example, there's a huge demand uh, to be downtown. I think that the other thing that, that landscape architects and others have to address is the issue of these suburbs that ring the old inner cities. Um, and in Toronto, we've made a few tentative steps. There's a thing called the Tower Renewal Project. We have a thousand towers, slab buildings from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which were built for smart young people and are now lived in by poor immigrants. And it's one thing to be poor in an inner, inner city neighborhood where you have access to public transit, another thing altogether to be poor in an inner suburb where you have to walk half an hour to buy a quart of milk. Um, and I think that the one big issue that everybody is kind of uh, fearful of is this issue, how are we going to deal with all of that kind of stuff? And I'm not even talking about the sprawl that goes on and on forever. And I don't mean to pick on Phoenix, but imagine what this city is going to look like and be like in 100 years, uh, even 50 years. Um, I don't think it's going to be pretty. Uh, so how do you deal with all these uh, disconnected subdivisions, these places that are connected by eight, nine, ten lane highways that have no future? And it would seem to me that this is an enormous issue, an enormous opportunity also for landscape architects, not the engineers. God help us, because uh, you know the traffic engineers, I mean, if ever there was a pseudoscience that, that, that sort of um, <laughs> laid waste to, to uh, this, our cities and, and to this continent, uh, they are the ones. Um, and, and I think that this is, this is the issue with the future because it seems pretty clear to me that, that as I say, that cities will eventually take care of themselves. The people who live there are relatively well-to-do, they're educated, they're organized, they know what they want, that's why they're there. It's the people who are left over out there that are going to become the big issue in the future. And I think that's what the, this profession has to address, the sooner the better. Well, all right, another, another topic on, up for this group is that they very much want to see landscape architects take the lead on big projects and be the prime and run the show. And I want to talk to you guys, you guys to talk a little bit about is, is, are they managing to do that? Is, are they successful at it? Chris? 
I think there, there have been a couple examples of this in Southern California. I mentioned the Orange County Great Park where you had Ken Smith's uh, office really running the show with architects uh, like Enrique Norton, you know, in a, in a clearly subordinate role. Same thing in Santa Monica with uh, James Corner um, being supported by the architect Fred Fisher and, mm -hmm. and others. Um, so there have been a number of these examples, but I think the, and this goes back to everything we were saying about d uh, working in cities too, there is an incredible opportunity as there's this return to the city, this re-engagement with the public sphere. Um, but I'm not always convinced the landscape architects are ready to seize it because it's really political skills as much as design ones, or if not right. more so, that are required. And this is a long Absolutely. story in the history of cities and the history of Los Angeles in particular. There's a, any of you interested in this history, a fantastic book called Eden by Design by a couple of historians, Bill Deverell and Greg Heiss, looking at this very ambitious open space plan from the 1920s by the Olmsted brothers and Harlan Bar Bartholomew, commissioned by the LA Chamber of Commerce. Um, and they produced an incredibly politically sophisticated document, which not only um, uh, contained an open space plan for all of Los Angeles County, but also the legislation in the appendix that would have gotten um, this open space uh, plan enacted and uh, had funding mechanisms and so forth. Um, and it was just a suggestion to me about how this question of the landscape architect's political savvy is really, uh, has been the key question, mm -hmm. um, even in a relatively young city like Los Angeles all the way back to the 20s. So um, it's a question of, uh, as others have said, figuring out who controls the purse, uh, purse strings, where the funding is, and uh, how to play a meaningful, meaningful role in, in, in engaging with those agencies. In Los Angeles, it's, the, it's our transit agency, Metro, which really controls a huge war chest of funds thanks to a sales tax measure passed in 2008 at a time when most other public agencies are really struggling to, mm -hmm. to raise any kind of meaningful money. So it's really, and we heard about bus rapid transit. There are these opportunities for kind of transit parkways, especially in a city that has a climate like Los Angeles does to really make landscape the centerpiece of yeah. those. And that has not happened. And I think it's partly because of landscape architects' um, challenges in, in navigating those admittedly very complicated political uh, uh, territories. There's also a tension between the desire to design and the fact that so much of the attraction of cities today is kind of the ongoing flux of the place. And it, it, looking at San Francisco, you can really point to landscape interventions of the last generation as having reshaped how the city looks at itself with Chrissy Field, toward the Golden Gate Bridge and then the Embarcadero Promenade, uh, which is on the bay. At the same time, the Embarcadero Promenade, strictly in terms of design, is pretty terrible. And it's a lot of cooks and nothing's really worked. But it doesn't really matter because you're walking along the bay with this city on one side and the bay on the other, and it's magical. Uh, Chrissy Field, uh, by Hargraves Associates here, very deservedly won lots of awards when it opened in the, uh, like around 2000 or so. It took an old military, um, pretty much just like where the military kind of dumped its supply buildings and turned, you know, created marshes, created a great lawn, so on and so forth, a walkway along the water. And it won lots of awards. It's beautifully sculpted and everything, very, very, state-of-the-art design of the time. But again, the part of that that everyone leaves with that's so magical is the walking along the water with the Golden Gate Bridge beckoning you, so on and so forth. The Great Lawn actually doesn't get much use because native plant people insisted on native plant, native bunch grass being used so that it actually isn't good to run on, the idea of a Frisbee quickly, you know, it wasn't a Frisbee field. The marsh had to be constricted because of historic preservation concerns about keeping the map of the airfield. So the marsh looks great, but it doesn't really function as a marsh, and the plans now are to try and expand it. So it's this interesting thing where it's a, I'm not at all faulting the landscape architect, but you are kind of, you are the person at this, the drafting table who everyone is pouring their agendas and their aspirations right. into. Right. And then it's kind of, ultimately, it's the place determines the success of the, of the design. So where, where else are you guys seeing like the, the, uh, 
the work falls short of the ideals. I mean, there's a lot of players involved in any landscape project, large or small, so you can't necessarily blame any of the designers because you have the clients at work too. So can you think of any notable examples where something is just kind of I think to a Not degree it way. requires, among us critics, it requires redefining what success means, what success looks like. In the same way that in architecture, I think we've begun, thankfully, to move away from this emphasis on formalism and thinking yeah, that sure. the success or failure of a project has entirely to do with the form of the final product. I think something similar is happening in landscape. And I'll give an example from Los Angeles. Um, borrowing a little bit from what Jeanette Sadek Khan has done in New York City in Department of Transportation, we've begun to uh, close off some little pockets, uh, some little short streets, and, and uh, reclaim the most public space. There's a pilot project in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles. Again, Rios Clemente Hale, um, the landscape architects on that project. Um, and it was done in a very quick and dirty way. I think the, um, the uh, budget was less than $100,000. And the result is not pretty in a formal way. A lot Ooh. of neighbors wish it could be um, uh, prettier, but th that was not really the point. The point was to kind of claim this uh, territory is public space. Uh, it's, a, it's a pilot project that will be um, reevaluated at the end of the year, and then perhaps there can be some fundraising for more permanent design. But I think it requires for the public, for critics, for landscape architects themselves, a kind of redefinition of what that success mm -hmm. means. And in this case, it was really a political victory that had to come first, and then design has to come, yeah. has to come later. Yeah. You know, in, in, in Cleveland, I think there's a, a growing tendency to uh, seek uh, people with really big names for, for the big jobs and not, not as much to sort of grow the local practice. And I, I think that's, uh, that's a kind of a challenge that uh, we're, we're turning over a lot of our major public spaces to figures like, well, Peter Walker did a beautiful job at the Cleveland Clinic uh, with a very formal uh, entrance to that facility. And now James Corner is coming back to Cleveland a second time to take a look at our, at our public square. And again, it's a situation in which all these folks are, are receiving a lot of uh, inputs from uh, different, different sectors. And I, I kind of wish the, the, the profession was more robust in, in our part of the country, that we're, there were more practitioners, uh, more people going into the field. Um, you know, it just doesn't feel like there's, there's enough, it's like we're outsourcing this. And, mm -hmm. and that's a danger in terms of not developing our own view of, of landscape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear the Ohio delegation here. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that we are in a position to know what will succeed and what won't. Um, there are f elements of the public realm that were loved at one era and not loved in another. And so we're in a constant change of uh, a s a state of change. I think that the advantage that landscape architects have is that it's by nature a more collaborative kind of exercise. Um, and I think that we, we need to get as much input as we can and do the best we can, keep things open-ended, and understand that it's part of a process. And I think the difference between architecture is that too often, or very often, is about creating the great artifact, the building that everybody will, the icon, as we love to call them now. And I don't see landscape uh, as the same kind of a thing. Um, so I don't think that we need to worry uh, so much about success. In you know, in, 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 in Toronto, I often you know, get the impression that if it isn't perfect, we won't do it. And because there's no such thing as perfection, we never do anything. Um, and, and so I think that we get hung up on this idea. Uh, and I don't think that we need to. I think we need to liberate ourselves and do what we can, consult as widely as possible. I completely disagree with Steve. I love it when we bring in the people from uh, other cities uh, who have fresh eyes and fresh ideas, can see things about our uh, cities that we have grown, uh, have grown invisible to us and so on and so forth. But if I just may also say so, I think that there's a, a backdrop to this whole discussion and that is you know, global warming. We, we are in the midst of this uh, uh, unprecedented climate change uh, uh, crisis. And it would seem to me that the natural uh, profession to look to to help us out of this, and you know, it's 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 all part of this 
this urban phenomenon that we see. I mean, the, the price of gas and the, and the cost of congestion and the time and all that kind of stuff. I mean, clearly the last 60, 70 years it has been a period of our history that people will look back at and think, what on earth were they thinking? What were they thinking? Uh, and so uh, we have to do everything we can uh, and, and inform everything we do with a sense of urgency, not just um, how to make a place pretty and uh, green space. I, I have to admit I'm sick of green space. I don't think green space is what it's about. I think it's about sidewalks. I think it's about benches on, on the streets. I think it's about the experience of being in a place Greens, you know, parks are a part of that, but there's a lot, lot more to it. And as I say, I think that the, your profession needs to become more messianic and, and need to get out there and, and, and tell people, you know, <laughs> we are in a crisis and we're going to help you deal with it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I want to mention that there is a, a federal program that is trying to deal with the question of uh, regional planning in the United States. And, you know, uh, in, in our country, uh, uh, planning and, and land use and zoning, that's all controlled at, at the municipal level. And the problem with that is that cities are competing with one another for, for jobs, for, for companies. They kind of steal from their neighbors. And uh, so you, you end up uh, with an interstate highway system having a, a uh, you know, sprawl that just goes out into the countryside. It's incredibly wasteful. And what you, you end up duplicating public services and building a higher overhead in terms of your uh, taxes that you have to pay. In Northeast Ohio, the big problem is that we're losing population while we're sprawling, so you have fewer and fewer people paying for more and more stuff. The Obama administration created something called the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. I don't know how many of you have heard about that, but this is a place to push. This is a program to support, a very concrete thing. It's not funded to a great extent. It's uh, 100 million bucks a year. That was in fiscal years 2010 and 2011. It was killed by the uh, uh, Republican-dominated Congress in 2012, and the Obama folks hope to bring it back in, in 2013. But they are uh, trying to start a dialogue at the regional level and to coordinate spending by federal DOT, HUD, and, and EPA so that those agencies are not working across purposes. I think we're just beginning to see the results of, of some of these programs in cities like Salt Lake, Hartford, Dallas-Fort Worth, Kansas City, uh, uh, Missouri, and, and Minneapolis. This is, a, this is a very important program. I don't think we're talking enough about, uh, about it, and uh, needs to have more awareness. Needs to have more awareness. I think you, you went last year, I think, to Pardon? find the farthest suburb from Center City, right? Yeah. You did a story about that. Oh, right. What right. inspired that? Um, so uh, th I wrote about a zombie suburb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, one of those, uh, you know, places that, um, uh, one of those exurbs that had been, um, you know, given, uh, la laid out dur during the boom time and uh, with water and sewer lines and then, and, and subdivided. And, and then when the bus came, um, you know, there was only a couple of stranded houses out there. and. Um, you know, I, I wrote about it because at the same time, Philadelphia had experienced this fir first population growth in, in half a century, and I was interested in, in, in seeing these trends reverse itself from this uh, endless sprawl. Um, and I, I went out there to see where, where, where the sprawl ended, and um, it was about 50 or 60 miles from, from the center of the city. Um, there's, there's one issue I think we really, we haven't talked about very much, and. Um, you know, this is really such a great error, uh, it seems to me, of, of park building, a great error for, for, la for thinking about landscape design. But one thing we're not talking about so much is, you know, how, how are we going to maintain these and how are we going to fund the maintenance? Because at the same time, cities like Philadelphia and, and, and Cleveland and San Francisco are, are building these really great public spaces. Um, there's kind of this optimism that we're going to figure it out, and, and cities, <laughs> cities are really crunched for, for tax revenue. Um, and and the, you know, the known options about how to pay, pay for parks and maintain them are, are not very pretty. It's, it's yeah. either you know, tax dollars, um, 
It's either some kind of friends group or, or support group, which has to constantly raise money, or it's this corporate sponsorship, um, which can get really, really ugly. And there was a huge fight in, in, in Philadelphia over Rittenhouse Square, which is one of the most beautiful urban parks at, uh, in an American city. And the friends group has been not very successful at raising uh, private funds to, to pay for the maintenance. The city pays virtually nothing. And so they hired a consultant who said, well, you know, you could put a, a cafe in the park and that could be branded and you could, you know, brand the flower beds, you could have little corporate signs. And, and the neighborhood was up in arms at, at, at the thought uh, of seeing PNC Bank, you know, this flower bed paid for by PNC Bank. So, you know, maybe the question I put to all of you is, you know, how are we going to figure this out? Yeah. But then, I'm, I'm sure. For a lot of you, the clients you have in the urban projects you've done are the developers who are doing the big tower and they want the nice plaza to look good that's the public plaza but also maintained. I mean, Inga's point's really good. Looking at San Francisco, I've been writing about this for about 10 years now and so many of the specific urban spaces I've written about have been offshoots of private development, so they're privately maintained, so on and so forth, and that gets away with, from that problem, but it raises whole other issues of access and how, you know, can you lay down on the bench or does the bench have little barriers every two and a half feet to keep any undesirable from being on it? Right, right. Well, we're getting close to time, but I want to ask each of you to think about this. Do you think the public, the people that you run across, your readers, the people you run across in meetings, people generally, do you, do you think they connect to landscape architecture the way we all might like them to? I mean, do they seem to deeply care about it? I think people really care about their parks, and, and especially neighborhood parks. I, I think we're, we're at a time when not only are people living in cities, coming back to live in cities, but you know, we're in this period where it's sort of like the post-job period where people have work but not jobs, and so their schedules aren't nine to five, and they, that means that they're able to go for a walk, to, to work in parks with their, their laptops, and so they're, they're using public space in an even more intense way than ever before because people just aren't chained to desks yeah. the way they used to be. So I think, I think landscape is hugely important. And I think when you see a good park, like Sister Cities Park in Philadelphia, which is this two-acre park in, uh, on, on Logan Square, which has a, a cafe, it has uh, a, a miniature nature park, and it has a, a fountain, and it's become the go-to place for, for families with young children. Um, you see people really, really respond to, mm -hmm. to those kinds of designs. Uh, John, are you hearing passion from your readers? I think, I, think, I think people appreciate landscapes. Honestly, I don't know how many of them associate landscapes, certainly urban landscapes, with landscape architects, yeah. uh, with all due respect. Um, Christopher wants you to be more messianic, and I just want you to accept that you'll always be the ones that they kind of associate with gardeners. Um, <laughs> But having said that, people know a place that feels good. Chris Hawthorne, what do you think? I am ambivalent about it. I think that on the one hand, there, there's still a lot of anxiety in a city like Los Angeles about open space. And when there's a campaign to kind of carve out a little pocket of space, there's a lot of opposition, mm -hmm. particularly from merchants, but also from neighbors who are worried about um, often in some really offensive ways, the element that an open oh, yes. space can yeah. draw. That's still in. 2012, that's still an issue in a city like Los Angeles. But yeah. more broadly, I think there is um, a real desire for spaces to gather. I think people, and because the city has been so private, as I mentioned, um, people in LA have the same, despite our reputation, um, we have the same desire to be out in public space and, and walking as, as people in other cities do. It's just that we don't have as many opportunities. And so when those spaces are built, um, I think people really flock to them, whether they're um, sort of faux urbanist spaces like the Grove uh, or they're real public spaces. I think um, people are just ready for um, exposure to that kind of space. And I think just to quickly pick up on something Inga said, I think there is a technological shift. I think the, the um, 
people's obsessions with their phones, and this yeah. is something I especially yeah, yeah, yeah. see with teenagers. They don't see cars in the same way. They see cars as a burden, not as a symbol of freedom. Mm -hmm. And that means they see public space in a different way. They're much more interested and uh, much more open to taking the bus because that's productive time when they right, can be right, on their right. phones. Driving is the one time the when they can't use their phones, and that has real, really profound implications for how they, they uh, engage with public space and landscape, sure, I would say. Sure, sure. What do you think, Chris Hume? I think the, the, the great conundrum for the landscape architect is when, the project is when the project is successful, people assume somehow it's natural, it's always been there, um, and they don't think about who did it, who designed it, who built it. Um, it's just there, and they like it. And I think when the, arch the landscape architect comes along and um, does what he or she wants, it's often seen as an intrusion um, and a way of hampering the natural use of a space. So I would have the feeling that, uh, that there is a certain antipathy uh, towards um, the people and the, uh, the landscape architect profession. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the great problem, the great issue, one of them anyway, is to make people aware of the fact that these spaces didn't spring you know, out of uh, you know, nature, that every last aspect of them was designed. Uh, and, and I think that it's important that landscape architects consult. Uh, people do use these spaces all the time, and they feel ownership over them. And so when a, an archi a landscape architect comes along, there's sort of a certain natural hostility that people feel. Um, and I don't think that, therefore, people think of, na of landscape architects as their natural allies. I think that they're very wary and very suspicious. Um, and I think it's because they, it's the word architect. An architect, <laughs> architect <laughs> implies ego, uh, it, it implies uh, masculinity, a macho kind of attitude. We need more women landscape architects. I think maybe that's the, the solution. <laughs> that. And I'm serious about that too. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and I think that you know, if you can sort of reorganize or, or rearrange that image, that, uh, that, that people will be much more welcoming. Steve, we've got about a minute. What do you well, think? Well, I think uh, in, in Cleveland, people are motivated by issues. So the, the bike community is becoming very active. I've been really excited to see the uh, creation of the scenic byway uh, that we have along the Cuyahoga River, which is uh, reclaiming the, the landscape of the old Ohio and Erie Canal. And that's having incredible reverberations in communities uh, along the tributary streams that are uh, organizing themselves to sort of take back the land from the Industrial Revolution. It, it, it's incredibly exciting. I think the moment the demographics really favor your, your profession and, and our part of the country, again, it, it, the question is uh, managing the tension between uh, the tendency to seek the outside expert versus developing some, uh, some more homegrown talent, which I think we need in our region to take care of landscapes at, at all different uh, scales, the, the, the big public square and uh, the local bike path, everything in between. All right, our time is almost up. Uh, to close things out, I want to thank these panelists for taking time to come and join us, please. Thank you so much for a really great discussion. I also want to thank all of you for joining us this morning. And I'd like to now welcome out our ASLA president, Susan Hatchell. Wow, I was so looking forward to that session. Uh, I, was so, I was like, what are they gonna think of this? What are they gonna say about this? That was fabulous. I really appreciate uh, Brad. Uh, thank you for putting that together. And thank you, panelists. That was really wonderful to hear your pers perspectives of our profession. Thank all of you for your attention. And I wanna personally thank you for your support of me. Uh, and you're just really making this a wonderful meeting. It's your energy and your enthusiasm that make all of us look so good and makes the, uh, the ASLA conference such a wonderful gathering. I think you know the drill. It is time to go to the expo, get your free coffee, enjoy your time with the, uh, with the exhibitors, and thank you so much. We will see you in Boston. Like I didn't care Hopped in